This is the Whole Man Academy podcast. My guest today is Neil Meller. Uh, where do we start? Neil was a footballer, international speaker, broadcaster, commentator, a father. We're going to get into that as well. Um, Neil, how are you and where are you, sir? Yeah, thanks very much for having me on, Anthony. Um, yeah, uh, I'm a man of many different things, as you can see there. Um, <laughs> so I, I'm enjoying life. I know it's difficult for a lot of people, isn't it, at the moment with COVID and the different restrictions. Yeah. Um, the sun's shining today, so I've got a smile on my face. It is. I uh, I know from speaking to a client of mine this morning who said exactly the same, like when it's, you know, when the sun's shining, um, it always reminds me of, um, you know, when the football season is, the, the pre-season is starting, which used to be, I mean, I don't know how that's going to work at the moment, but like when it's in the, in the August time and, you know, after the... Um, after all the kids are going back to school and everybody starts playing and training again in, in the summer, it's uh, it's a good feeling. Well, uh, I know well, for well, you... Well, for, for Anthony, for some it might be. Now, now for me, pre-season was hard. I was thinking, yeah, get through that. get through that and bring back those winter days when I was playing football. That was the preference. Well, that uh, you've touched on, You've uh, there's plenty of points to go through. One of them was about pre-season and, and, and the training side because that's where, you know, it, it might be very well people seeing... Uh, you know, guys playing football in front of big crowds, but you know the the hard work is done behind the scenes. So, how was that for you? Because when you started, you know, obviously playing football as a youngster and then working your way through to being a, you know, on the elite side of it. So, was that preseason always painful for you, or? Uh... Yeah, well, I, I like to think myself because I was an attacking player, a centre forward. We prefer the shorter stuff, the, yeah. the sprints, <laughs> rather than the long distance running, which the defenders and the midfielders seem to prefer. So for me, the preseason was one just to get through, just to stay fit. But but my body, because of the injuries that I sustained, that was always a really challenging period for me uh, yeah. preseason, um, because the running was was something that my body didn't enjoy, and it was so much, so often it was like, oh, just get through this. Did you? That's a really interesting point because. I know even with Steven Gerrard, where he had, you know, a lot of the, the issues with kind of as your body is growing and trying to adapt and obviously your training. So did you find that you had some of those issues from quite a young age? Because I guess, I mean, at what age did you start playing football? Yeah, I, I didn't start playing football till I was 10. I mean, yeah. you, you look at you look at some of the kids now and they're the kicking a ball. I was kicking a ball young course, but I didn't join a club till I was sort of eight, nine, ten. Um, first professional club was Man City at 10, whereas now the academies are taking boys very, very young. So that was when it all started for me. But I used to like other sports, cricket, tennis, uh, and, and play them at a decent level. And I think for me, I sustained quite a bad um, back injury at 16. And I think it was because of the tennis was, was really taking its toll on me. Right. I wasn't a great server but I really tried to get my serve going. Um, and I think that was, uh, my technique wasn't great. And yeah, I had a um, stress fracture for like seven months out. It was, it was a tough one, that. Yeah, and I guess you never know how, as you say, with something like a stress fracture, how that kind of impacts on you, you know, your, your longevity, especially when you're trying to get to that elite level. Um, well, I know if we take you back to, obviously your, your dad was a professional footballer and, you know, played for various clubs, including Man City. We already kind of mentioned that. Um, what was it like for you growing up um, you know, did you? I don't mean did you feel under pressure to be a footballer, but did did you know you wanted to be a footballer, or was it kind of something that came gradually to you watching your dad through the years? Yeah, it was something I always wanted to do. The thing for me was I never got to see him play um, because right. he was um, yeah. So I was. I've got an older brother who's eight years older, and I think perhaps you could say my dad learned a lot from him, maybe pushing him a little bit too much, and then was uh, slightly different in how he treated me. Um, and my brother never made it. The best he got to was Aberystwyth Town in, I think yeah. I said that right, in Wales. <laughs> I hope I've said that right. We won't try and spell it. No, <laughs> but I watched him play in like a Europa League qualifier one time and he got beat to some Maltese team. I told him a bunch of waiters they were that day. <laughs> Um, he wasn't too pleased, but but yeah. So so for for my dad, he was a big influence on me because he played professionally. But I never got to see him play. Um, but but he was always there supporting me, school games, all those sorts of things, and his advice was invaluable. I was just thinking that's the thing, isn't it? You've when you've not got. Um, I know we talk about football agents as well, and the and the the benefits of them, and the. Um, Is is yeah, it? it is. I was going to say. Gonna touch on that. Okay, okay. I've read enough football autobiographies, and uh, you know the agents don't always come out in a in a great light, and maybe no surprise there. But I guess having a dad who's been there, done that at the at the high level, must have been a real help. Um, but when you first then started, um, as you say, from your ten years old upwards, um, at what point did you realise that you were going to be a professional footballer? Because I know there's so you know, it's such a small percentage of kids, especially these days, that actually go from the academies to actually signing real contracts? 
Yeah, well, I used to play two years above myself and um, and I'd do quite well at that level, sort of Sunday league. And I'd score like whatever, 40, 50 goals a season. And it got to the point where the teams were actually complaining that I was too young to play <laughs> <laughs> because I was doing so. So I actually got banned from playing Sunday league because I was too too young to be playing two years above. They were trying yeah. to protect me, but, but it wasn't affecting me at all. Um, so I got banned. And at that point, that was when I joined... Man City, but but it wasn't like it is now where they, they send they're looking at hundreds, thousands of kids all around the area. It was um, a case of can I have a trial? Yeah, okay, great. We know that you score goals and all that sort of thing. Um, and then it, I took it from there. I mean, back then there was only about ten of us at, at the um, School of Excellence, which is what it was called then. Whereas now there's a lot more kids involved with the the different age groups at, at the professional clubs. Do you think also it's um. You know, people know how much a premiership premiership footballer uh, can earn these days, especially if they get to the very top. And, you know, I, I know people that are, have had kids that are quite good at football and they're, they're pushing them because they know that it's it's big business as well. Um, so sad. It's so sad to hear yeah. that, isn't it? You know, you know I, I'm, for me, I wanted to be a football player because I wanted to... To yeah. score a winning goal in the FA Cup final, it was it was nothing about money back then. And back then, I, like I was born in the early eighties, there was no football then. Uh, sorry, there was no money in, involved with the football back then. Yeah. It wasn't until sort of the late nineties and, and early noughties where the money really came into the game. So for my generation of player, it was still about I love football. I just want to play football, and, and that was what the dream was for me. I wanted to do what my dad had done. Yeah. And I sort of touched a little bit on that in Makino, actually. Um, but that sort of passion, where we get that dream from. And, and that was certainly mine. So um, take me back to the first. I know in, in um, one of the videos I watched of one of your um, of talks kind of said about um, being called in to sign contracts and thinking that you're going to be on a couple of hundred pounds a week. And then the manager says, you're not you're not good enough. Um, yeah. And I know for I've got one or two friends who's, who've, whose kids are playing for you know, some of the London clubs and it's, it's, su it's such pressure on a, on a child when you're hoping that you're going to make it and then you get told, you know, and maybe it means they develop further down the line, but you get told at that point, you're basically, you're not good enough. I just wondered what, what that was like for you at that age. Difficult. Yeah. Yeah. It was really difficult. And, and I really go to town on that in sort of McKee now, because that's for me, it was a huge adversity, a huge challenge, which at the age of 16, which is what I was, yeah, um, it, it was a moment where, hang on a minute, no one's ever told me I'm not good enough before. Yeah. How am I not good enough? Because I've, I've been the top goal scorer. Surely I'm, I'm, okay, I'm good enough. Um, so, it's, so it's that mental challenge to the sort of beliefs and the sort of behaviours, attitude, how you react to that adversity. That was really key for me. Um, but it came as a shock. It definitely did. Um, but then it was it was something that didn't stop me wanting to get to where I got, where I got to. All right, well, let's... Um, I'm going to... I just find it so interesting for the, as you say, it's so much of it is about the mindset as you're going through the ranks as well, because, you know, I know certain professional players that might not have, or they've certainly had certain knockbacks, but they still became a professional. Um, and we'll certainly touch on your, on your keynote, but let's, let's take you to 2004. Um, the, the, the goal against Arsenal, which I laughed because my, my brother-in-law is an Arsenal supporter. So I knew he'd be <laughs> super excited to, <laughs> to, to hear, hear that you could be on the podcast. Um, but I just wonder for you, I mean, you were still, I'd say, a young lad, it seemed like, at that point when you scored that goal. And it was against some of the greats, you know, the Arsenal team then was, I mean, Arsenal were rubbish now, let's let's be honest. Uh, and uh... We can definitely say that because this this podcast may date and, and Arsenal may get good again one day. Yeah. But as we speak, Arsenal are in the bottom half of the Premier League. Yeah. They are a very, very average team. <laughs> it's, it's uh, and they're still playing their, paying their guys so much money, which I always think is quite funny. But yeah, back then they were, they were um, well, the Invincibles and, you know, some of their players were just some of the, the best around. So I just wondered if you could... I don't know, sum up what that feeling was like when the when the ball dropped and you hit it from a, a considerable distance, um, especially at the cop end as well, which let's face it, that you know, that that kind of is the icing on the cake, as it were. Yeah, yeah. No, I definitely touch on that in, in my key now. I mean, the build-up to that game was it was a super Sunday. Now the, the super Sundays back then, that was a big deal. You, you know, yeah. nowadays the kickoff times are all over the place, aren't they? But back then it was it was the big game on the Sunday afternoon and it was like you say Arsenal the best team around and I'll always remember when they got to the ground that day there was a big buzz I knew I was playing I put my tickets by the uh, the ticket office with the uh, the receptionist and said mum and dad are coming there you go there's my tickets for them yep. and then I went straight into the uh, into the doctor's room before the changing room because I, had, I actually had an injection before the game because right. I was struggling I was struggling <laughs> with an injury at that time 
And I knew I was playing, but I needed that injection of uh, cortisone just to get through it, just to try and numb the pain from my knees. So I did that, got going, and uh, it, it was more surprised than anything else. Now, now I talk about the feeling of scoring that winning goal, but in the 90th minute, we're one one against the best team around, which Arsenal were then. And I was more surprised that the manager hadn't brought me off. As a sub. <laughs> it was like, why has he kept me on? And I actually turned to Sol Campbell, who was marking me that day. And I said, we had a free kick. Can I have your shirt after the game? Now, I don't even collect shirts. Now, Sol was a great player. Of course he was. But he wasn't a favourite player of mine. Yeah. And like I said, I don't collect shirts. I have no idea why I asked him <laughs> about getting that shirt or not. Anyway, the ball came up. Sol Campbell misheaded it, whatever. And, and I've hit it. It's, it's gone into the back of the net. And, uh, and like I say, in the keynote, I go through that feeling of being stood in front of the carp and, and that emotion involved. Um, I never did get his shirt, you know, after the game. Yeah. <laughs> I never got his shirt after yeah. the game. But um, it was nice to get the winning goal instead. What, what must that be like now as a... Um, you know, I'm, I'm quite a few years older than you. I'm 42 now, so I've been a Liverpool supporter since I was pretty much six or seven. Um, and I think I said when I'd emailed you about inviting you on the pod, you know, I've got a photo of Tony Adams presenting me with a trophy for my football accuracy skills at a summer thing. But I've got my little uh, my little crown, crown paints kit on. So <laughs> for me and all my friends that are Liverpool supporters, it's not just about if you were playing for Liverpool, it is scoring at the cop end. How yeah. special is that when, when you've got... I mean, I guess then the capacity was obviously that much smaller than it is now. But the you know the times I've been there, the noise is amazing. Um, what is that like? Yeah, well, what what I would say is that you've heard the the old cliche when ex players say what a difference the crowd make at Anfield. Those special European nights, and they do make a difference. They make a difference because when I'm out there as a as a Liverpool player. The fans are with me and I can feel that and it gives me confidence. Now, as a football player, it's really hard to have that confidence, believe it or not. You want something to go well for you. Um, there's all those sort of doubts and fears that can happen as a football player. But the Anfield crowd as a home player give you that confidence, give yeah. you that belief. Whereas if you're an opposition, now I've never experienced it as an opposition player, but I can only imagine you thinking, oh, they're all against us. And they, they've got some great success stories in the past and uh, yeah. and no doubt create a lot of fear. I mean, some of the best players have been to Anfield and struggled to cope with that sort Melted. of thing. So the, yeah. fans, the fans are undoubtedly a huge, huge um, advantage to have when you play for Liverpool. So, you know, this is one of the big things at the moment. With with no fans at stadiums, um, and, and we can debate that with, I, I think that um, it just, it, it sucks a lot of the life out of, of watching it um and in fact the last game i watched whilst i was abroad was the liverpool arsenal game and it's just not the same when you haven't got the, the fans there and you know i do wonder whether uh, i'm trying to think who shared a statistic about you know away teams are winning a much higher percentage of games in the last yeah. season or two um from your obviously you know lots of footballers what's their take on playing in empty stadiums week in week out at the moment well, well, like I say, when I wanted to be a football player, it was about that buzz of scoring the winning goal and sharing the moment, connecting with the fans. The players can't do that at the moment. They can't yeah. connect with the supporters. And it's really difficult. I mean, the quality of the game isn't the same. The passion isn't the same. The, the professional footballers, of course, they're going to do the best, but they thrive off the fans. And, and some players thrive more off the fans and some players thrive more without the fans. Right. And maybe that's why more away players have thought, Ah, there's no, there's no one inside Anfield today, mate. You know, I, I'm not going to get booed or and everything like that. And it can make a difference. There's no doubt about that. The sooner the fans are back, the sooner we can get the game. Certainly, I've always loved football back uh, the way the way it should be with the fans because football is nothing, nothing without the fans. We all have our favourite players, of course, yeah. managers and all that, but it's all about the fans. Yeah, I think it's so important. And um, I know from my playing at a um, low level of football, even when you went to an away team and you know they might have had uh you know hundreds of supporters for them and you had you know a couple of the stalwarts that bothered to come along and it would just be that thing if you're away from home uh and you had them all giving you abuse let's face it they're not they're not there to uh, be nice and cheer you on so you had a lot of abuse and i can only imagine now it is a much more of a uh, part of the pun but a level level playing field um so yeah i'm just hoping that all that that will come back well the other um you know, one of the one of the great games that you played in and scored in and uh, assisted in was, of course, um, the Olympiacos game, the Champions League. And that what, what I was going to ask you first is, uh, there's probably always one of those questions of like who's one of the um, you know the great players that you've played 
either against or you know on the uh, on the pitch with and Rivaldo was on that night who was a utter utter wand of a left foot legend yeah um growing up did you get to that stage where you were playing football against some of the people that maybe for you you kind of looked up to as a kid yeah yeah there, there was always that um I, I mean obviously Rivaldo for me when I was growing up he was a superstar wasn't he at Barcelona yeah. and when we played against him that night there was always the feeling he was capable of doing it but he was on his on his way down, yeah. so it wasn't like the, the Rivaldo that had been the world player of the year. But we knew we had to be mindful. Didn't expect him to score. I'll be honest. When he <laughs> scored that, I was like, "Oh my God, what's going yeah. on?" But but we think of Olympiacos perhaps these days and think that they're not a great side. That that was a good Olympiacos team. They were top of the group when they came to Anfield on match day six that night. It was it was one of those incredible nights, certain that we still talk about, still remember today because of what happened but at half time after Rivaldo had scored it was a case of wow we have got a lot to do this yeah. second half we needed to score three goals I spent 15 minutes at half time staring at the manager Rafa Benitez jogging on the spot just trying to get his eye bring me on because I was so yeah. that night He's like please <laughs> please just just bring me on. look at me because I'm ready look at me I'm jogging on the spot I was knackered by the end of uh, half time but he never brought me on he brought somebody else on cinema pong goal yes and, who scored uh, yeah, I, I was fuming. I was like, "What's he doing, bringing him on?" And then he scores. <laughs> I'm thinking, "What a brilliant decision that was to bring him on." Um, and then eventually he brought me on, and I had a moment myself before Gerard scored one of the best European goals, certainly at Anfield, that uh, the fans will remember. Yeah, well, that I mean, let's let's rewind back to the goal. You beautifully skipped over the fact that you scored uh, the you know that one of the the important three, as it were, and that was a pure kind of poacher's goal because you were kind of off balance. Uh, you know, the ball was what, like hip height and you managed to uh, smash it in the, in the top of the net. But then to to go on and I know you cushioned the header for Steven Gerrard to uh, to score again from distance, um, you know, which is one of his kind of things that he seemed to uh, do extremely well. When the ball came to me, it was Jamie Carragher on the left wing. Was like, What's he what? doing up there? What is Jamie Carragher? <laughs> anyway, so he's dinked it up to me. Now I'm a centre forward. I've got a few options. Do I control it? Maybe, maybe lay it off to somebody. Do I flick it on? Do I maybe turn and try and get a shot myself? Um, but I went for that layoff option, which there was two players, Steven Gerrard and John Arnarisa. Now, John Arnarisa was a very, very good left fullback, a Norwegian international, loved a screamer. Yeah. But if I was going to nod it down to him, it was going to be on his right foot. And about one in 600 would be on target with his right <laughs> foot. I thought I'm better go with uh, Steven Gerrard and uh, and like I said the rest is history he did the business for us yeah that was that was ridiculous and I always love um when you can watch the um you know on YouTube or or, or back when DVDs were around but you could watch the you know the the top goals of um you know the Liverpool campaign and that is always one of those I think it was uh it was Andy Gray that you know shouted what a hit or something like that and it's just yeah. It's just an absolute classic. But in fact, I was going to ask you about the managers that you've played under. I mean, I know there's a, several throughout the career, but, um, you know, with uh, obviously uh, Gerard Hullier, who passed away in uh, December, I think it was. Um, and am I right in thinking that he gave you your uh, professional debut? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, that was what, sad, what was it like when you because because Gerard Hullier and I know Rafa, obviously, as well, two kind of uh, incredible managers. And I always wonder, like, what what's it like when you first have that manager come in and it's up to you to impress them? Yeah, well, I mean, for me, my first step was trying to get away from the youth team at Liverpool to try and progress to, to the first team where Gerard Houllier was um, was the manager. Um, it was the it was the real start in football and certainly in the Premier League in England of the change of the continental players coming in. There was a lot more of that going on and that yeah. influence of the foreign coaches and Houllier changed a, a great deal. He changed Melwood, the training ground. He, he redesigned this unbelievable new training facility. Gone was the old building and, and the basic that, that it was. It was now this, this incredible, we had a sauna, a jacuzzi, swimming pool. I had a dressing gown in my locker. It was like, oh my, this is like, <laughs> like a spa, but, but, yeah. but it, it was like proper looking after the top international players. Um, and it was a big difference. Even the diet, all of a sudden, when I first went down there, there was Sprite, there was Coke, there was Fanta in the fridge, filling my boots, Snickers, Mars bars. That was all gone pretty soon afterwards. And that was where the change was coming in. Julio was huge for that. So, so when he gave me my debut, that was a huge vote of confidence because there's a lot of experienced top internationals that were ahead of me in the pecking order but, but yeah. he believed in me to give me that chance and it was a real proud moment um, my family were all there it was against Ipswich Town at Anfield and um, a, a night that I'll never forget what's it like then when um, you know I've only spent 
let's say 38 years dreaming of being a professional footballer so I have to ask these questions but when you first um I know you know you've got a chance of being you know in the first 11 but at what point let's say for that at what point did you know is it because a team sheet gets put up or do you get the nod a day or two before it varies it, honestly it varies every game now, now I'm a young kid making my debut the manager was good he pulled me to one side the day before and he said listen you're going to be making your debut so that gave me time mentally I said oh my god I'm going to be playing <laughs> and, uh, uh, I didn't have, didn't have enough time to get my hair cut my hair was awful but it gave me enough time to get my family there to, to watch what was a, a, a special moment for me so that was that was nice rather than throwing up me last minute and thinking oh mum and dad aren't here I'm gutted yeah. that sort of thing that's a funny one because I do I do think, you know, you wonder whether those things go through your head of if you know you're going to be on the TV in front of thousands of, you know, possibly <laughs> millions of people and you're like, I haven't had, my, I haven't had my hair cut. So um, uh, did you did you ever go through a phase of, you know, uh, with with Gaza and, and Beckham where they were changing their hairstyles to uh, blonde and, and or did you just keep it uh, since you're slightly more sensible? But yeah, uh, can I be honest? If you look at my hair now. It's only ever changed once. That's it, yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and do you know what? It was when I was at West Ham. I went on loan to West Ham for a period early on in my career. I was struggling to score a goal. And one of the lads said, you're not getting your hair cut till you score. And it took ages. I was like, oh, my God. But when you get it done, you're going to have to have it shaved off. So I scored a couple of goals in the game. And sure enough, I, I had it all shaved off. I looked terrible. So that was the last time I've changed my hairstyle. I've kept it to what it was when I was about five or six. Nice and yes. simple. Uh, I always think it's the partners that get uh, the most pain. I remember many years ago, um, yeah, going to the, the hairdressers and having a you know number two or whatever was all over, and then you go home and you whip your hat off and you're like ta da, and you're like, <laughs> what the hell do you look like? And you're like, yeah, this isn't that wasn't the reaction I was expecting. So well, it, um, it, ruined, it ruined my pictures from the 21st. I've got a twin sister and I was down <laughs> at West Ham and I've had this skin I'd done just before my birthday. And everyone's like, what have you done? And, and yeah. obviously all the pictures from the 21st, I've got this silly skin. I'd... Uh, it, just, it just makes me laugh because it makes you wonder, you know, with the footballers these days where they're having things, you know, um, embedded in their haircuts and logos and stuff. And I'm like, man, I wonder how much time they spend just thinking about <laughs> what, you know, what, what patterns to have in their hair. That's, as, as old school uh, has gone out the window. Um, well, I wanted to ask you with Rafa Benitez, what was it like um, kind of, because I know from from my view of what he was like, he's not someone like, a, let's talk Jurgen Klopp, he's going to be cuddling players and, you know, giving them a um, a real sense of that he loves them. Whereas Rafa, I yeah. sense, was someone that would just look at, look at you across the room. So what, what was your take on Rafa? Yeah, what a top manager. What a top yeah. manager he was. Um, well, funny enough, when I scored that goal against Arsenal, I scored the winning goal <laughs> against Arsenal. We're in the dressing rooms afterwards. And, and like you say, if it was Jurgen Klopp, you're probably getting a hug, maybe a prolonged hug off someone yeah. like Jurgen. It was just a caught eye with Rafa across the room and he just gave me a little thumbs up, a little smile. That was it. And that was enough for him to say, that's OK. I accept that. That, that was good work yeah. today. <laughs> there, was, there was nothing more than that. But Rafa was a brilliant, absolutely brilliant manager. Um, he was on the training pitch every single day in his shorts, whatever the weather was. He was out there in his shorts, yeah. even though he's from Spain. Uh, the weather was completely different, of course. But he was, for me, a tactical genius. He he taught me a side of the game tactically, which I'd never really experienced before. And I learned an awful lot from him, sort of how important the shape is, the position that we need to be in, in and out of possession of the ball. I just wonder, yeah, with Rafa, because obviously him going on and you know being part of the Istanbul ridiculousness of of, of the comeback, um, it was one of those with him where I remember thinking once he'd because he was laying the foundations, but you were waiting for something, uh, you know, we never quite got to the the, the league as it were, and, and seemed and amazingly waited a long time afterwards. Um, but let's take you through to the Champions League. After you'd kind of got through to all the, um, you know, the knockout stages and and the quarters and semis, um, what was it like for you? Because I know you, um, you know, you, you're desperate to be in the team for the Champions League. Um, what's the build up like to it? Yeah, well, well it's, I, I talk about this in my keynote because for me, now I've experienced adversity a lot throughout my career. And I was experiencing that that time yeah. when we were going to the Champions League final. But uh, like I mentioned, it doesn't matter how I'm feeling, how, what's going on with me, my workplace, which is Liverpool, my organisation, they're buzzing because they were about to play the biggest game of their lives. And they're my mates. You know, I have breakfast with them every day, uh, lunch. Whilst I wasn't training with them, I was injured, but I'm still around them every single day. And, and I can see them all absolutely buzzing, ready for this game. Um, so I was looking forward to it. Like, like everybody else, there was, we were underdogs 
from, yeah. from, from the moment we'd beaten Olympiacos, we were always the underdogs throughout that knockout uh, phase, even in the final. That, um, it's funny, we said about playing like Olympiacos where they had Rivaldo, but that that team, you know, playing against Liverpool had Crespo. I mean, it had some un- unbelievable players. Um, and I just wonder, let's say you had been uh, been playing. So do you look across at that kind of team and, you know, how do you uh, kind of compare yourself to them and, and try and maintain your confidence? Not easy, is it? <laughs> Not easy. Like you say, when you're looking at the team, you think, oh, could have done with him being injured or something like that. And it, yeah. it was a brilliant, brilliant team that AC Milan had back then. But um, yeah, I sort of talk more about what happened at halftime. You know, that's that's something I speak quite a lot about in my in my keynote about the mentality of the players and and how they reacted to that uh, the scoreboard to go out the second half because at three 0 at half time. I, w- I was in the crowd. I couldn't play because I'm having that adversity. I'm thinking, oh, one more, and I'm going to the airport. I want to go yes. home. I, I, these are my mates that that are getting humiliated. Hammered, in, the, yeah. in the biggest game of their lives, you know, not just the fans inside the stadium, but around the world, Liverpool fans must have been thinking, I've been looking forward to this for so long, and this is how we're going to perform. Um, but, but it hurt more because I knew how much the boys we're looking forward to the game. Yeah. Um, but, but of course that second half and, and extra time penalties is a night we'll all always remember. Well, talk to me about, so were you sitting in the stands or were you? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so I was there in the stadium that night yeah. uh, and then, it, and then I got on the, on the pitch after the game as well, which was, uh, that was a story in itself because there was, there were 69,000 fans officially yeah. inside the stadium. <laughs> That night, and I reckon there must have been sixty thousand Liverpool fans. It was it was majority Liverpool. There's only a little pocket of AC Milan behind the goal. I remember it now. Uh, and at the end of the game, we were part of the Liverpool contingent. There was only yeah. ten of us, 10, 10 players that that weren't involved, um, and I was one of them being injured. And we're trying to get on the pitch, but all the Liverpool fans are trying to get on the pitch, and I <laughs> stood there in my Liverpool tracksuit. And this uh, Turkish steward's thinking, listen, you're, you, I don't know who you are. You're not, yeah. Yeah, he's like, like, listen, I've got no da- idea who you are. So it, luckily, one of, the, one of the lads who was involved was cup tied was Fernando Morientes. Yes. And he'd won the Champions League three, four, whatever, however many times he's won it. And he said to the steward, listen, I'm Fernando Morientes. Uh, can I go and see my teammates? And he's like, I don't believe you, don't believe you. He had to get his passport out. <laughs> He showed him his passport to show him it was Fernando Morientes. Next thing, the steward, the steward's hugging Fernando like that, uh, thinking he's the best thing since sliced bread. Let's Fernando on the pitch, but then Fernando let made sure every one of us got on as well. So wow. we could be there. So when Steven Gerrard lifts the trophy at the end, um, I'm on the podium with all the confetti. Oh, it was a great moment. That. Talk to me about what happened after, because what, what's that? Um, I mean, that's the, the biggest kind of club game pretty much there is. So what's the process afterwards? Do you all just go straight back to the dressing room and start drinking? Or I know there's kind of press conferences and then do you just carry on partying through the night? Yeah, yeah, I was quite lucky because at Liverpool, I actually experienced a few, a few trophy wins. Um, 2003, 2000, obviously Champions League, 2006 as well. Yeah. Um, and, the, and the protocol was we go back to the hotel after the game we put the trophy in the middle of the dance floor. There's a free buffet. There's a free bar, and you just hit it as hard as you want. If, if you don't drink, that's absolutely fine. If you do drink, fill your boots, and yeah. that's sort of how the protocol was. So, so as you can imagine, um, but after a, about an hour or so, everyone's jumping up and down, chucking the trophy everywhere, <laughs> dancing about. But, but the difference was back then, the kickoff time was quarter to ten, something like that, at mm-hmm. night, because it had to suit the English audience kickoff yeah. time. So by the time we got to the hotel, it was like half two in the morning. Mm. The lads had played 120 minutes, penalties, were drained emotionally. And it was like, we've got to go again. We've got to kick on to celebrate what was an unbelievable night. I just wonder, because the next day you must wake up and feel like you've kind of dreamt. I mean, I I think I said to you that I was in uh, Budapest and I went to the bar with a big group of people. And at three nil down, I was getting barrages of texts from my mates laughing and saying, this is humiliation. And I... Honestly, contemplated I might. You know, I was on an early flight back to, or going to Italy after that, and I thought I might just swerve at half time because this is this is embarrassing. And that point where my friend had bought us a, another pint, so I've got you another pint, and I said, oh, "I'll just finish this, then I'll go." And then it, and then it, then it kicked off from there. Um, that is one of those nights um, where you know you just just the comeback of it. Um, I it's so rare to have that. Well, unless you're a Liverpool supporter. 
And therefore, that takes me through to Liverpool's 4-0 demolition of Barcelona in the Champions League, uh, you know, in, in recent times. Um, were you either at the game or if no, were you, were you watching it? No, no, well, I, I couldn't get a ticket. Yeah. As you can imagine, to, to get a ticket for that was so hard to get. Um, we're 3-0 down from the first leg. Yeah. <laughs> and everyone was like, oh, no, Salah's out. Firmino's out. We've got no chance. Yeah. And uh, I watched it in my kitchen with my 10-year-old boy thinking... I just want to win the game. I just want to beat them and yeah. make a game of it. All of a sudden, I think it was 1-0 at half time. I think, still got a chance. Still got a chance. And the celebrations in, in our kitchen when, when that second half was just unbelievable. 2-0, <laughs> 3-0, 4-0. It was like, oh, my God. That's one of the best games I've ever watched in my house, yeah. Well, I was going to ask you about, um, you know, the fourth goal was, was one of those that you just... You know, we've all seen screamers and we've seen ones that come off of people's knee, but you very rarely see one that's a... A, um, a corner where the other team was switched off. Um, just uh, unbelievable. But um, what was your thoughts with, I mean, it's Trent Alexander-Arnold who played it and he's such a young talent. There's, I know there's lots of young talent around at the moment, but he for mm. Liverpool is, uh, is one of those that's an absolute gem. Um, what's yeah. your kind of take on the, the way he's risen up through the ranks? Yeah, um, he's, um, he's developed into an outstanding player, one of the top players, certainly in terms of his position within Europe. Um I think that's one of the benefits. Now, I came through at Liverpool Academy from the age of 16. He's been there from a very young age. He understands what the football club's about. He's got that connection yeah. with the supporters because he's a local boy. And he's and he's been really um, able to develop well at Liverpool Academy. Rather than some players going out alone, they've nurtured him so that he was ready for the first team. And um, and he's taken his opportunity. He, ha he really has. He's um, still a young man, but he's done extremely well to be in the position he is now. Well, seeing as we're talking of the current day Liverpool, which, you know, it's, I, I know in the last, I know this season's just been a, a slippery slope down. Well, they started very well, but a slippery slope downwards at the moment. But how much of that do you also put down to, um, you know, the, let's say the, the best central defender in the world getting injured? And basically, I think he played pretty much every game last season. Um, and this season, you know, very early on, he got, uh, <laughs> quite frankly, it was a horrendous tackle. If they'd done that when you're in a nightclub, you'd probably get arrested. Yeah. But um, how much of the impact do you think on Liverpool's kind of uh, season has losing that, you know, Virgil van Dijk is one of the one of the greatest players around at the moment? Yeah, it's, it's been disappointing, hasn't it? Um, I mean, it was an awesome season last year for Liverpool to win the Premier League title. And we thought, same again, we'll really mount a serious challenge. This season, but it hasn't been. I think the fact that Virgil van Dijk, like you say, has been a huge loss for Liverpool. There's, there's been a lot of injuries, a lot of um, different centre-half partnerships. I think 18 in all competitions. I saw I you that, shared that stat on your Instagram yeah. of the different well, partnerships, which is ridiculous. Well, that sort of disruption is going to affect anyone. The fact that our third most longest standing centre-half partnership has been two central midfield players. Yeah. It, it, it's going to, it is going to impact. There's no doubt about that. You can look at other reasons of what, as well. I think a big factor has to be the no fans. You know, Liverpool just haven't been at that same level without, without the fans. So the sooner the fans get back, the better. Um, and of course, the other teams have been desperate to beat Liverpool this yeah. season to get their own back. So it hasn't been a good season for Liverpool. There's still a lot to fight for, for top four, the importance of Champions League football. That's how football's changed. You know, I'm talking about me growing up as a young player. I just want to play in the top level of England. I want to play in the FA Cup. Now, it's all about playing in the Champions League, isn't it, for a yeah. lot of these young players coming through. And that's how important it is for these top clubs. So we, so Liverpool re really need to be in the Champions League. And there's a big battle ahead between now and the end of the season to get in there. I was just thinking it's one of those where, um, you know, I, I don't know about Van Dijk and his... Uh, when his comeback would be but at the moment you kind of look at the league is com completely written off but then it becomes uh it seems ridiculous to be saying if i'd have said last year that liverpool were just concentrating on the top four you'd have yeah. said you've you've gone nuts um yeah. but yeah i just realized what a huge blow it was um now um let's go on to talk about jürgen klopp i mean he uh i actually had uh, i don't mean dinner with him i was in a nightclub in ibiza a couple of years ago and and this is what i loved about him I can imagine, um, or I'll set the scene. It was a, it was a pretty cool nightclub, um, a nightclub restaurant, and he was sitting there with like white, white box dress trainers, a suit, but you know, black suit, but with a white t-shirt underneath, and sitting there smoking a cigarette, and and I think it was his partner there and some friends, but uh, he was so, I, I couldn't imagine, um, I know David Moyes sitting there in Ibiza <laughs> with. <laughs> <laughs> you know, didn't think quite work like that, but you no. know, he was at the bar chatting to people, and he just seemed like such a cool character. 
Um, yeah. What's what's your I don't what's your take on him because obviously he's a great manager. But for you, have you had much kind of dealing with him? And yeah, a little bit. So I think what I would say is he's really bought in and connected to what Liverpool Football Club's all about. And I think that's one of his his big strengths that that he's really been able to do. He's brought a togetherness to the club that. I think every football club wants that sort of togetherness, don't they? I want to be part of our football club. I want to be able to connect with you as my manager. I want to like you as my manager. And, yeah. I, and I think Jürgen certainly has, has brought that at Liverpool. Um, the mentality, um, the winning mentality, delivering trophies. Uh, and also the fact that, I'm not sure about you, but I want a hug from Jürgen when we win. I'm thinking, I want to be on the pitch yeah. getting a hug of you. I'm and up for got- that. Yeah, but but and even that, like you're saying, he looks cool on holiday. He just looks chilled. He's not like got some big ego. He doesn't bo- he's not bothered what he looks like if he if he's not had a shave, not had a haircut. He's not bothered. You know, he just wants to get yeah. out there and, and do his best for Liverpool as the manager. So I think that's been really appealing and quite refreshing to see in today's game. Oh, I definitely think he's one of those managers that you look at and I, you know, friends of mine that aren't even Liverpool supporters that say you'd like to play for him because of the energy and the positivity that he kind of brings to everything. Um, and when he celebrates, it's just, it's kind of comedy because, um, you know, that's that's real, real passion for you. Um, well, I was going to ask you, talking about passion, what's it like um, for you when you kind of left the game? How do you replace that, I know, the, the, the fun of training, the camaraderie and the banter of being in the dressing room? Because um, I only know from my uh, career working in, in London for um, huge companies where there was hundreds and hundreds of guys on the same floor doing the same job and you spent a lot of your time pissing around you know that was that was what the fun part was you had to do some work sometimes but what was it like for you when you finally said you know what, I'm not no, not playing anymore um, and and you leave that kind of environment behind a bit difficult it was difficult um, because from the age of five I've I've always had a structure in my life. I've always been told where to be. There you go, go to school, primary school, go to secondary school. From the age of 16, when I leave secondary school, I'm in a football environment. I'm told where. So all I have to do is turn up and play football. So so when I left football, it was like, no one telling me what to do. There there was no one paying me any money. Um, It was like, oh, wow, I've really got to take responsibility. And it was a big shock. I bought my first ever diary. I was like, I better stop filling this in and and trying to give myself a structure. I mowed the the lawn for the first time. I was like, I've always had a gardener because I I was a football player. I could pay pay for him. So I was like, wow, the reality really struck home. And it's difficult. And that was where the mentality side of thing was really important for me because I've seen a lot of mates struggle coming out of the game and lose everything. So the mentality, it was a difficult time. It was a challenging time, but I had to focus on, on, on what I wanted to do next. And for me, that was that media side of things, which I really enjoy doing and, and still enjoy doing now. And, and now I've moved on to the keynote, which is another area that I really enjoy talking about. Some of my experiences, the insights from, from playing football, but make it relatable to people who haven't played football as well. Yeah, oh, I think it's, you know, you um, for guys that have, like yourself that have played in those high pressure environments, there's so much to learn, not just from your experiences, from but from what you've learned from the people like your Rafa, Gerard Houllier and, and, and different people like that. And I just wondered for yourself, did you, um, obviously moving into doing the keynote speaking and also kind of working for Sky and, and is it Liverpool TV as well, but yeah. did you did you have that as your plan when you left or was it like, shit, I've left, now what do I do? I always enjoyed the media side. So as I came to the end of sort of the late twenties, I was still playing, still feeling good. Yeah. I liked the media side of things. I wrote in, I was playing for Preston. I was wrote in the, I had my two page spread in the, uh, in the match day program. I was working a little bit at local radio. So I enjoyed that side of it. Um, and I, I attacked a degree as well. I thought, right, I'm going for it. I'm going to do a degree while I was still playing. Um, Cause I thought that's where I want to go down long-term, not the coaching. It was more the media side of things. So I knew, I wanted to go down that route. But when my career came to an end, it was like, I've got to go for it right now. I've got to chuck everything into it. So it was it was challenging in the aspect, in, in the reason why you're saying it was really inconvenient. So I'm, I'm working for, for no money, for free. I'm working at daft times, taking phone calls at like six in the morning, 11 at night, just to, just to try and work out my identity, um, certainly within the media world. And uh, in the end, that persistence paid off to, to be where I am in terms of the work I do now. That's a really important point because one of the things we talk about, you know, through the whole man Academy for guys is how important it is having a purpose. Um, and, you know, for a lot of guys, I think some people think that the answer to their problems would be if they have loads of money, then they haven't got to go to work. And then you realize that very quickly, you know, we know either guys that have retired or guys that have, um, maybe had 
been made redundant and got really good payoffs or left the company and very quickly you're like what am i what am i actually doing so mm. I, I i guess i know from different kind of autobiographies i've read guys that are, are, are leaving there's a huge void to fill because you're you're missing out on the um you know the day-to-day -day task and i remember i think it was rio ferdinand who had just moved uh uh, down to Chislehurst where I used to live so I'd, I'd see him at the station because he was setting up his I think he's got a kind of a media agency company in the same building I used to work in but I remember on one of the documentaries he spoke about um, not having a clue like how to work the washing machine and stuff like that because mm. everything was taken care of for you so yeah. did did you find that yeah no no exactly that um like i say mowing my lawn it was like never had to do something like that it, it was all of a sudden having to take responsibility for things that because i was playing football in a privileged position i could be lazy of course i was lazy you're almost encouraged to have a lazy mentality as a football player because every everyone does everything for you yeah. all you've got to do is turn up and play football you know you don't have to take responsibility so so that was a big thing for me learning um to handle that but the, the lack of structure is massive for, for any player certainly football player and i think people in the armed forces have said, said something similar haven't they yeah when, when they come out of um certainly that it's right i've got to find something to do to occupy my mind yes you can talk about the money side of things and you need that of course to to um to maintain your living but the structure for your mentality is so important yeah that's actually it's funny you say that the podcast um, that was released last week. One of the guys is a former Royal Marine. And I think two or three weeks ago, I interviewed a guy who was um, went through the special forces and the special boat service. And he'd spoken about that thing of, you know, you come out um, and you're like, well, I've lost my identity because, you know, you're not a Royal Marine or a commando or a footballer or whatever it was, fill in the blank anymore. You're just you. Um, and yeah, it's certainly a certainly interesting time. Well, um, let me talk about red cards. Now, I'm going to bless you with my football career. I played as centre-back. I was extremely good, as you can imagine. Um, and I only got booked once in my whole career because I was so good at timing tackles. Um, <laughs> but what about yourself with red cards? You heard my keynote. I've read a little bit of it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I did touch on it. Yeah, do you know what? I never got red carded once at school. Um, yeah. I never got booked for dissent. In my entire professional career, I never got booked for dissent never got red carded but one time I did get red carded was in this one game for Liverpool which was a pre-season game and I speak about that in my keynote and um, I, I needed VAR I needed VAR of course I did because there's no way if somebody would have seen that on the telly they would have given a red card it was a heat at the moment thing yeah and the referee might have made a mistake but uh, I can forgive him now but at the time I was thinking ref please change yeah. that card from red to yellow <laughs> well I just wonder for um, I mean, if we if we pick Stephen Gerrard as an example of someone that you played uh, played alongside, and he, you know, had some of those heat of the moment ones where I'm trying to think what game it was where he came on and was it against Everton? Came on and got red carded, you know, pretty much. I was there, right? Was Manchester United, Man United, that's it. In his last season, and, and I text him because um, I said, Stevie, I want my kids to watch you play for Liverpool. Um, so, so pick any game you want, rubbish yeah. game. He was like, yeah, fine, no problem. So I text him early on in the season. He said, right, I've got your tickets for Man United at home. I said, that's, that's one of the biggest games. I said, Jackpot. I was like, no, honestly, just give me Fulham, give me West Brom, anything like that. I, I just want my kids to see you play yeah. at Anfield. So it's fine. So I said, right. I want to see you afterwards, sign a couple of pictures for the kids, a little few pictures, all that. Um, get to the game, he's on the bench. <laughs> he's on the bench. How, how can Steven Gerrard be on the yeah. bench for Liverpool at Anfield against Manchester United? So we're not happy about that. Anyway, it's 1-0 to United at half-time. And Steven Gerrard's warming up. So we've gone down for a cup of tea, thinking, right, we'll get a cup of tea. Gerrard might be on at half-time, might come on second half. As we start walking up to the, um, to the seats, because... Because where the the players' lounge was, where where we had tickets, it was a three or four minute walk. Everyone's saying Gerard's on, Gerard's on. So oh, come on, kids, let's get up there. So we get into the stand and we're like, "Where's Gerard?" Like, <laughs> oh, Ger Ger someone went, Gerard's been sent off. I've got, we've literally missed two minutes of the second half and he's come on and been sent off. So my kids never even got to watch him play at, at Anfield. And sure enough, of course, uh, they never met him after that game because that was um, it, yeah. he was so upset afterwards. But it was, uh, so I missed the sending off. It was like unbelievable. That is, that's one of those classics isn't it, where you couldn't make it up. Um, I'm going to tell you that when Liverpool, um, in fact, when Gerrard scored against West Ham in the FA Cup final, 
Liverpool were three two down with about a minute to go, and I had to drive down to Kent, and I thought I can't, I cannot sit and watch Liverpool lose to West Ham, who weren't, you know, had Paul Kuczewski playing for them. Come on, and um, I, so I left, and I drove down with the radio off, and when I got to my friend's house, I got out, and it was summer's day, and he went, "Wow, those penalties were amazing." Yeah. <laughs> you go, what? What penalties? Uh, in the Liverpool game, you're like, hey, what? So, uh, yeah, it's, it's one of those classics where you're like, just, I don't know, you, you couldn't write that kind of stuff. Well, let's go on to your transition from, from footballer into the speaking world, um, because doing your kind of keynote speaking and pushing, um, you know, aside the, the football side to talk more about resilience, um, what was that like when you first kind of decided, OK, I'm now going to start speaking about it? Because it's a difference between having a maybe a relaxed chat with a one on one. But then when you're standing up on stage with a, you know, I know you've played in front of thousands of people, but when it's just you and it's you speaking, I just wonder what that was like. Difficult, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> really difficult. And and for somebody, certainly for me, who who's used to being on sort of screen with, with a lot of the TV work that I do, I would think I'll be fine. Yeah. But, but when it came to it, I was like, all of a sudden my voice was going, I was getting all nervous. I was like sweating. I was like mumbling. I was all, it was, it, it was not good at all. It was a huge difference. Um, and I struggled. I really, really struggled. There was a lot of vulnerability about going into it for me. I think that for me is now I'm an ex football player. A lot of ex sportsmen do the sort of after dinner side of things, yeah. which is that Q and a, and it's a different sort of environment, which is something I didn't enjoy too much because I felt as though my name wasn't strong enough to really hold a room together. Yes, right. I played for Liverpool, which was fantastic, but didn't play four or 500 games. So I've gone down the key now where I have had moments for Liverpool. I've been around some of the best players, Stephen Jones, some of the best coaches as well. And I've got a lot of stories to tell and insights with my experiences that suit that side of things yeah. a lot more. And I've really enjoyed talking about it to people who don't even like football. I've had people come up to me after hearing me talk and say, I don't even like football, but I got what you were saying. And for me, that's what it's about, getting that message across where people can relate to me, even though they don't like Liverpool, even though they don't like football. And, yeah. and that's a side of it that I've really, really enjoyed doing. But on stage, it was hard to start with. There's no doubt. There was no getting away from that. You've got to get through it, unfortunately. I guess also I look at it as, um, you know, I've, I've done... Uh, talks to I uh, say crowds of kind of up to like 150 so not um not huge crowds but it's still that moment where you stand there and just before you're about to start you, you have like a voice in your head um and and you can see everybody looking be like yeah go on impress me go on then and you're <laughs> thinking right let, let's get this right um how would you sum up um kind of the keynote talking about resilience is it are you basing it on the learnings that you've had throughout your career yeah, yeah. So, so, so for me, it's about my experiences and my insights that to be able to relate it then to to my audience, but do it in a way where it's not specific to football. So I can I can give different examples to help people relate to maybe things I've experienced that they're thinking I didn't realise that was linked to to maybe how we, how you've um, experienced that as well. But it's it's um, it, it's a, a forty five minute. It's it's a full on. There's there's laughs in there. There's a serious side there. There's an educational side there, motivational side there. So it's something for everyone, and I, I really try and keep everyone engaged. Certainly in in that sense. No, I think it's it's so important, especially at the moment where you know this year, this twelve months, is, it seems like a, a whole year of lockdown. Whether we've had some little bits in between where we've been uh, let out to play, the rest of it has been a a kind of a, a painful experience for a lot of people. I just wondered for yourself, I mean, you've got, you've got kids um, and, you know, and a partner and family and um, how's it been for you with the effect of, um, you know, the uncertainty of the last year? Yeah. Yeah. Difficult. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the first lockdown was, do you know what? I didn't work for six months. It was a long time. And you're thinking what's going to happen. What, what's yeah. around the corner um, for my kids. Now my kids are both in, in, in senior school now it was the last few months of my little boy's primary school experience which was taken away from him now we all remember those last days don't we of primary school the fun days out and all that side of yeah. things and he, that was taken away from him that was really sad and it was painful to see um not knowing what was going to happen long term um, but also the fact that they weren't allowed to go to school they weren't allowed yeah. to 
to see the grandma and granddad. They weren't allowed to see people. We felt trapped. Now we're a close family because there's, there's four of us and we're fortunate because we've got a small garden where, where we could go in the garden, have a kick about and that sort of thing. But, you know, it was, it was really tough to think about how, how, how much people are really struggling at this time. Um, and so, um, I mean, this, this lockdown again, the kids not being able to, to be at school, yeah. both in, in senior school, my little girls um, approaching GCSEs in, in a couple of years. And it's it's a time where they want to be socialised and they want to be in a different environment. They're in the bedrooms all day learning. Yeah. And it's... It's not right. right. It, it, for me, when they go back in a couple of weeks, I, I think they're the ones who deserve huge credit. Yes, of course, us parents are thinking, oh, we just want them back to normal life, but they've had to put through so, been put through so much. And, and it, I'm talking about resilience in my keynote. Yeah. The resilience kids have had to, to show. And if you can come through it, and no doubt they're all been affected because they've all had to struggle through this. It's, um, cool. it's, it's I just want to see them back into school as soon as possible. Yeah, I think it's, and like you said, there's so many different examples of, you know, I've got family where um, little Aunt and Teddy who are kind of, uh, they've just had recent birthdays, but, you know, just at senior school. And like you say, you think back to all the uh, stupid stuff that I was doing at that age and, you know, the, the, the parties where you'd be going to cinemas and you'd be going to this and that and all that's been taken away. And, and for them, they're just spending, uh, you know, eight hours a day looking at a screen and that's not what kids should be doing. You know, so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm all for getting the kids kids back to school. Um, let me ask you for yourself, especially through lockdown, because it must be really hard for the footballers is in the first lockdown to be keeping fit. And I saw a few kind of, you know, online videos of them all doing their own. You know, they've all got their um, houses where they can train and stuff like that. But what about for yourself in that six months? Will you do you still stay motivated to I'm not saying keep match fit as such, but what's your level of fitness now and how do you maintain it? Oh, God. don't don't to be honest. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I mean, for me, I, I finished playing professional football through an injury with my knee, so so running for me is is quite quite a challenge. Um, I can go sort of run around the block in a straight line, but any kind of change of direction, that's where my body really struggles. Um, there was lots of bike rides. I bought myself a cross trainer, not an expensive one, just a couple of hundred pound, and I've battered that. I was doing five, six K a day. Yeah. Um, so it's just sort of keeping ticking over, keeping motivated that way. I mean, the weather was unbelievable, wasn't yes. it, in the first lockdown? So I was... I mean, going on bike rides for periods that I thought I'd, I'd never do because no one was on the road, so I felt quite safe as well. Yeah. Um, so Are you so, quite close to the to countryside, so you're easily accessible to... Yeah, yeah. So I live on, on the coast, so um, so it's quite nice. There's a few nice walk paths and, and cycle paths to go on as well. So it was... Uh, it was a nice time in a strange way. I kept myself fit. Um, whereas now the weather's not being great. You're thinking, oh, got to go on that cross trainer for a few. A yeah. Few days. So what about, um, seeing as you're on a podcast, what about podcasts? Do you listen to them? And if so, what do you listen to? You know what? I, I, I'm not a big listener when it comes to, to podcasts. Um, there's only one that I listen to, and that is the uh, the Whole Man Academy, as you know. Uh, big, so, yeah. Big, um, Big believer, great, great show, a great podcast. Um, <laughs> no, no. So f- for me, I'm not big on my podcasts at the moment, yeah. um, but something that I will get into. Uh, it's one of those. I know it's a growing thing when you've got. I mean, there's so many podcasts around. I know the Peter Crouch podcast was was very popular as well. Um, but he stayed, of, he, he stayed over one night at my house, Crouchy. Oh, really? Did you <laughs> have a, what, in what bed? Because he's too long. Yeah, well, well, he just moved to Liverpool and uh, I was injured at the time. So come on, Crouch, we'll go out for a night out. So we ended up going for a night out and uh, he said, oh, can I stay at yours? I was like, yeah, fine, no problem. So honestly, it's that classic line where I said, listen, you're in the spare bed. And so he's gone in the spare bed. I've gone in in the morning to say, come on, we need to go to the training ground. And his feet were dangling out of the bed. It was like, <laughs> Crouchy, that's embarrassing. Come on. Yeah, let's go. no, it's... What, what a character. I know I've read his, uh, whether it's book one or book two, don't know. But um, yeah, he, he's on my long list of people that you'd like to have on the podcast one day, just because he's, um, you know, you're going to end up, God knows what you could be talking about. Um, well, I just wondered, I mean, with the Whole Man Academy, one of the big things for us is about the importance of guys getting together to talk. And it's a bit like at football, you know, what a lot of guys have missed out on in the last year is being with groups of lads, mates at pubs, football you know, all the uh, at work, all these different things. What about for yourself as you've as you've kind of gone through your career as a footballer and then the keynote speaking side? Who would you say kind of you would turn to 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 kind of talk things through with? 
My dad, uh, still very close to my dad, speak to him quite often. My brother, my older brother, I said he's eight years older. I was best man for his wedding. He was right. best man for my wedding, uh, still very close with him. I'm on a few WhatsApp groups where there's a lot of interaction. Thankfully, with football, aren't we? We're sort of predicting, we have like league table. We have to predict one team every weekend who we think will score the most goals. So there's right. a, li a little bit of fun that way. Um, and, and it certainly keeps you, um, keeps that interaction going, certainly when, when times are low and, and you need that little bit of interaction with some of your mates. Yes, uh, that's one of the big things. I know plenty of guys are, are missing at the moment. And actually... The podcast recorded last week there was it was four guys um who have started online fitness training platform in london but you know for the hour it was great to talk about fitness resilience health wellness and have a laugh and uh you know that's that's one of the big things i think that most people are are kind of missing out on um and for yourself with the, with the keynote speaking um what's what's next is it keynote speaking and then you kind of um what's the word like bring out kind of more talks and develop them yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So at the moment, um, um, the strongest one is resilience. Yeah. But, but I'm going to go into the transition one, certainly as well, because I feel as though that's an area of I've half written that one at the moment, because you have to put a lot of sort of time aside to, to write it to make sure it's uh, at the level needed. So resilience, that's out in the bag, delivering that, which I'm really enjoying doing. Um, delivered to Liverpool, actually, which, which is a good one. Um, so it's nice to be enjoying that but as soon as this lockdown is lifted i can't wait to be going to different places and having the bigger audiences and, and being able to really interact and not not pick on people in the crowd but maybe yeah. have a little bit more of a laugh rather than thinking it's a bit more bit harder on the, on the old zoom remote calls yeah. Isn't it? so um yeah th there'll be more different um areas to go into but it, but even in my resilience one there's teamwork that i discussed there's leadership as well there's communication all within that resilience one because yeah. of some of the people have uh, i've come across and, and dealt with it's such a it's such a big word these days resilience and i uh, i don't think i'd ever really thought about my level of resilience when i was younger but i know you know the more i got into personal development the more i understood that you know you can't help what happens to you but you can help how you react to it um, and i just wondered for yourself how do you for the guys that are well it's probably 75 percent of our listeners are guys so how for you um would you consider that they can kind of be more resilient in life like you know day to day uh, i think it's that isn't it the fact that we can't change what's happened in terms of that that challenge that adversity you know i talk about rejection i talk about mistakes injury those sorts of things they've happened but it's we do and we can change how we react how we respond how we believe we can change those beliefs to what's happened and and the impact they can have is is enormous in terms of wanting to have the positive outcomes we all want to have positive outcomes of course yeah. we do we want to be successful we want to be happy and the power that though just being aware of those beliefs of those reactions what responses will help us even though it's hard it's not easy of course it's not easy <laughs> yeah. um even though it's hard being aware of them a little bit more can help us in times where we are really struggling so um something that i'm really conscious of now and and, and everyone has adversity of course we, we all do in different ways don't we and there's no limit once you've had a certain amount of adversity in life it's not a case of right you're done that's it finished yeah. it still goes on and still goes on so uh, if we can have some kind of uh, a, a go-to thing which which is what i have from an adversity which i talk about in my uh, in my talk then it may help one or two people yeah, I think that's it. That's uh, I don't. That's one of the key things about any of the kind of talks that either I give or things I listen to. I'm always looking for. We always say like the golden nuggets because someone can sometimes speak for an hour and you might not be able to remember most of it. But if you can take one thing out of be it a keynote or a podcast or an interview or something like that, and I just wanted going back to the. I mean, not just the Liverpool managers, but all the different managers you've played under. Um, you know, which one for you? Or no, I should change the question to. Which ones of those were more focused on resilience? Because as a footballer, we know if you go, you know, one nil down, you can either crumble or you kind of, you know, know that there's still X amount of minutes left. Yeah, well, I think to be a manager, you, you're going to have to have had an incredible amount of resilience to be in that position anyway. And they all had it in their own ways. Um, but I think the most successful one would probably have been maybe Rafa Benitez because yeah. of, of, of what he's achieved throughout his career. I mean, even won La Liga with Valencia up against Barca and Real Madrid. And um, I mean, even coming to England, 
not really understanding the language in itself. That's, you know, that's an yeah. adversity. That's a challenge in itself. I was thinking, wow, I've got to deliver and talk to 20 lads and get what I believe and what I want them to do on the training pitch every day. And that language barrier was, was something that he overcame and that resilience. So for me, I think Rafa has continued to display that throughout his uh, managerial career. But the, do you know what? Some of the managers that I played for all, all, great in their own ways. The best ones are the ones who play you every game. When your name's on that team sheet, they are my favourite manager. Yeah. I'll I tell you why I laughed. What you said earlier, um, you know, from, from my illustrious football career, I was very rarely a substitute, um, mainly because I moaned so much if I was, but <laughs> I knew I would do the same thing where you'd make sure you warmed up right in front of the manager, stretching, jogging, whatever you wanted to do, just whatever you were doing, just do it right in front of him. Uh, yeah. And you assume that if you were in his way, he'd, you know, he'd have you on his mind. So <laughs> yeah. there's a, there's a little tip for any young, young footballers out there. But it didn't um, work. It didn't work at half time. Yeah. <laughs> for me. It's, it's one of those things, isn't it? You never know if you're, um, if you're trying that stuff. Now I was going to ask you out of all the goals that you scored, um, what was the, I don't know. What was the one that was most memorable for you? Would it be the Arsenal one? I think if I want to be sort of selfish, I'll say, yeah, Arsenal, because um, obviously it was, I was on the back of every newspaper in the country the next day on the Monday. My mate was in Australia. He was like, oh my God, you're on the back page of newspapers in Australia. I was like, what? Really? He was like, yeah. Um, so in terms of that personal accolade, that was unbelievable. But for me, it, it was the night I was involved with against Olympiacos, the score to be part of of the celebrations and what we went on to achieve was, was, was incredible. So uh, yeah, yeah but both great. And do you know what? I never even went out after either night, never even went out celebrating. I went home after I'd scored against Arsenal, sat on my, on the couch, mum and dad, mum made me a cup of tea and I watched match of the day. So there you go. <laughs> shattered. I was absolutely shattered. Do you know what? I, I was just thinking, um, it's one of those things where people assume you want to go out partying, but I'm sure the emotional, uh, you know, the toll on you means it's say maybe, you know, for some of you just need to go home and, and take a bit of a rest. Um, all right, well, I know I've, I've taken up an hour of your valuable time, but I was going to ask you the, the last question was with um, uh, like with, with Liverpool, where do you think that the, um, where do you think the team is going to finish this year and what do they need to do differently to get back up to where they were last year? I think Liverpool finished top four. Uh, there's 13 games to go. Yeah. I think there's a real battle on between uh, three, four, maybe five teams involved with that top four. Liverpool certainly good enough to finish in the top four, I think. Could do without any more injuries. You know, the, the tragic news about Alisson, the goalkeeper, losing his dad. He may yeah. miss a few games now for Liverpool. Henderson's out for a few more games. Um, so that's a blow. Jota will be back, which will help Liverpool's attacking players. Still playing in the Champions League, of course. Um, I think Liverpool will get top four. I think next year, if they want to compete again for the title, just need to hopefully not get as many injuries. Get Valerie Joe Van Dijk back fit. Yeah. And, and, ho and hopefully have a little bit of luck that way. Maybe another signing may come in, in in the summer, which will help Liverpool as well, strengthen certainly in terms of um, the, the, the team that way. So Liverpool aren't far off. Competing. That's the thing, is it? It's not, it? It's not like people are sitting there saying they need to add certain people to the team. It's like if just don't don't have so many injuries. Because if you bring back, you know, half the people that are injured, you've got a, a, a super strong squad. Yeah, um, I, I think it's always good to freshen it up with at least one decent sign. I think the club may yeah. well do that. Still talk about Wijnaldum possibly leaving with his contract situation. So uh, it'd be interesting to see how that one pans out and, uh, and maybe another attacking player. Oh, it'll be interesting to see. And, and it's been more painful um, with... Man United going back up above Liverpool. Well, my friends that support Man United are all suddenly come out of the woodwork again. So uh, with their with their memes and their and their text messages. So it's it's no surprise there. Um, and what's your plan for this afternoon, Friday afternoon? Friday afternoon, I've got to go for a COVID test because um, <laughs> I'm working for Liverpool. And if you, if, so I'm going to go and watch the under 23s against Arsenal. Liverpool be Arsenal. Right. Under 23s. Um, so if I want to go to the Liverpool site, I have to have had a COVID test. So that is my right. plan. Got to have a COVID test, which is the joys of a Friday afternoon for me. There you go. It's just what you need. All right. Well, I appreciate uh, I appreciate all your time. I could literally just spend hours talking about uh, Liverpool. Um, so, um, and, and thanks to Ronnie for putting us in touch as well. Absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah. Pre appreciate your time and appreciate all the, uh, uh, some of the great memories you've given me and my, my friends that are football fans because it's, uh, it's priceless, that kind of stuff. Thanks for having me. <laughs> it's a pleasure. All right, I'll speak to you soon. Brilliant. Thanks, Ed. Thank See ya.